You should have a number of things in your hands there, one of which is what I call a lecture guide, uh, which has uh, on the top the title, Early Latin Tribal Culture and Greco-Etruscan Influences. There is a kind of system involved in putting these together. On the upper left-hand side, you can see the number of the course, HIST 2130, then a slash and a zero 01. That means it's lecture unit one. Then the title. Uh, if you went to your syllabus, you would find exactly the same lecture unit one and title. And then just below it, as I promised you, is the assignment from the text, uh, Roman numerals chapters one and two. Okay? And then what I do is I go through uh, the material we're going to do is I just sort of write down all the important names and uh, often unusual words that I'm pretty sure you don't know or maybe you don't remember or something like that. Um, I add a lot to these things. I mean, it's not some, you can't assume that everything said is on one of these, which is why you're going to have to also take notes. Now, the other things that you have with you uh, consist of uh, your PowerPoint presentation, um, which is the same thing that you'll see me working with up here on the smart board. Um, I gave you this one here. I gave you one image per page. Sometimes I'll have to put two images per page, depending on how many we've got, so we don't kill too many trees here. And then I supplemented your uh, uh, your PowerPoint with some images I decided after I printed these out you needed, one of which looks like this, and the other of which on the back of it looks like that. Okay, So you do a lot of map work in my classes, and uh, the main idea uh, is, is that you should probably uh, follow my lead. If I draw something on there, you should draw something on there. It's good for your brain to feel your hand doing things. It helps uh, stimulate your, your memory functions and things of that nature. What we're going to do here tonight in this unit, and I don't know if we'll have enough time to watch the film I brought with me or not. Now that I know that very few of you have a textbook, uh, the urgency of it may not be as pronounced. We might have to do that next week. But what we're going to do here tonight is look at what sort of influences came to bear uh, upon what are eventually the Romans, the Latin-speaking peoples, uh, in their prehistory as well as in their very early history uh, from a variety of different cultures. And obviously, as the title suggests, we're interested ultimately in the influence of the Greeks upon uh, the Latin-speaking peoples. Uh, and the Etruscans. It might surprise some of you uh, that, um, at least culturally, uh, the Etruscans probably had a much bigger influence on the Romans than the Greeks. We tend to think of Greeks as being uh, very similar to Romans and vice versa. The more you get to know the Romans uh, in this class, uh, the less like the Greeks they will seem to you. Uh, some of you had my ancient Greece class or other classes where we talked a bit about them. Uh, one of the great ironies of history is, is that they did end up having to work together. They really are not much like each other at all in many ways. Uh, the, the hyphenated phrase Greco-Roman is incidentally not something the Greeks sought at all. Uh, and uh, we'll see later in this course exactly why. Um, you've got a number of maps that we're going to look at. Um, but before we do that, I want to draw your attention uh, to this item here. Uh, you'll probably see this at the beginning of every single PowerPoint. It's kind of a road map uh, through the semester, sort of the major periods of time in Roman history. We won't get there this week, but next week we're going to cover the Roman monarchy. And, and, and most people don't remember that Rome started out as a monarchy. In fact, they were a monarchy longer than we've been a country. Uh, and so it'll be an important period that is actually the period during which most of the cultural features of Rome will be fully formed. Then we'll have something called the Roman Republic, which will last not quite five centuries. Uh, you have a vested interest in understanding the Roman Republic. Why? To some extent, but what are you writing a paper on? And, and the collapse of the Roman Republic. There you go. So there's obviously some important stuff that we're going to cover in there. And as part of that, we're going to look at what are called the struggle of the orders and something called the Roman Revolution uh, as uh, one of, or sort of in tandem, the series of convulsions that bring that republic down. Then we'll end up with the Caesars and something called Imperial Rome, the Rome of Emperors. 
And there are two basic periods of time, what is called the Principate and what's called the Dominate, uh, during which, again, even with emperors in charge of both periods, you have a, a different form of imperial government. Uh, we will not get to the Byzantine period, but if you were to take a Western Civ course with me, you would learn that what is known as the Byzantine Empire, which is the surviving Eastern Roman Empire after the fall of Rome itself, is itself an extension of Roman civilization. Uh, but Rome's impact is obviously very, very strong. Tonight, though, we're going to look at the period of time before uh, the uh, uh, development of the monarchy, the influence of other peoples, and you'll need this map here uh, as we start talking uh, about it. Um, there is a date that you see everywhere in not just modern history books, but the Romans themselves uh, uh, talked about the day upon which or the year in which Rome was founded. More or less around 750 B.C. is when uh, the city of Rome is said to have been uh, founded. In fact, um, uh, using the tools of archaeology, um, there was something there long before that. Uh, which is not unusual. Most of the places where major cities developed started out in the Neolithic age with uh, settlements of one kind or another. Uh, more recent research tells us that um, at least by 1000 BC, there was something like a town uh, in that part of Italy. And if we go down to this map here, uh, which I've provided to you, and it's very hard to read from up here, that's why you have it uh, uh, in your hands. Uh, Rome is in this area here, sort of at the knee of the leg that seems to be the shape of the Italian peninsula. Uh, so as early as 1000 BC, we have some sort of uh, uh, habitation in that spot in what we call the Early Bronze Age, the Early Bronze Age. Okay. Now, uh, this map here, shows you what we call the Euro-Mediterranean world. Uh, Italy has a number of strategic advantages right here in the center. Um, I, I guess I should mention things like this is the Mediterranean Sea right here. We have Africa down here. We have Europe up here. Over here is technically Asia. But we tend to refer to Western Asia as the Near East. In that region. Italy is centrally located, uh, which is, among other things, going to eventually give whoever dominates Italy uh, a central location by which they can dominate the Mediterranean Sea. And that is going to be a key issue for the rise of Rome uh, and ultimately her ability to rule over virtually all those lands that, uh, uh, that I just mentioned there. Now, Italy itself, um, going, let's see, let's go to, we'll go to this map here again. Italy itself is mountainous. This mountain range that seems to stretch the length and breadth of the Italian peninsula are the Apennine Mountains, the Apennine Mountains. Um, they look rugged. Um, if you were, as some of our soldiers were trying to fight your way up the Italian boot and the German army is entrenched there, they're very, very rough, okay? But they're not as rugged as were mountains, let's say, in Greece or in other lands. In Greece, the mountainous terrain actually had a huge impact upon their political development. One town hardly had communication with another town, except if they went by sea you end up in Greece with very small political units called city-states, okay? The Apennines in uh, Italy um, are not such a great barrier, uh, and between them are a lot of passes. It's easy to get from one side to the other if you know where the passes are. As a matter of fact, one of the advantages that Italy has uh, is, is that it's, it's, it's possessed of a great amount of arable land. What does arable mean? Farmable. Farmable. You can grow crops on it, which wasn't true of Greece, incidentally. Greece had a shortage of arable land, which is why so many Greeks go to live somewhere else. Uh, they got overpopulated. But Italy is a place that has a lot of broad plains between the mountains. 
and among the passes. Uh, and, and that meant, as we'll see, very differently from the Greeks. And I warned you, the Greeks and Romans would be different, right? The Greeks tended to get into things other than farming, into commerce. They tended to get into manufacturing. The Romans think farming is the only honest occupation. They are a farming people. They are so agriculturally focused, they think people who are not agriculturally focused are somehow dishonest. In that sense, they're very much like the Chinese, the other great imperial people on the other side of planet Earth. If you're not in farming somehow, then you're up to something. That's their basic attitude about you. Now, you may not actually have your hands in the soil, but owning the person who has their hands in the soil means you're in agriculture, as Romans would see that sort of thing. And so there are two things, as we'll say over and over again, that Romans will eventually like to do. They like to farm, and they like to fight. Okay, And often the two are related to each other, the farming and the fighting with each other. Italy has a lot of good rivers. Greece doesn't have hardly any good rivers. Okay, Italy has good rivers. Um, we have, let's see, I don't really think I have a map here. Yeah, I do. Let's go to this map here. Um, we have the Po River in the north, around which there is a great uh, deal of uh, very, very rich soil. The Adiga also in the north. Now, of course, from our point of view, uh, the important river is the Tiber, the Tiber River in the center, uh, which is, of course, the river on which the small town of Rome uh, would be founded. Now, one of the advantages of the Tiber River, and therefore an advantage for Rome, uh, is that um, if you try to sail up the river from the uh, from the sea coast, you run into sandbars. Now, normally you wouldn't think that's very good. Uh, larger vessels, particularly warships, cannot get over the sandbars. That is an advantage, which means an attacker can't reach you from the sea. But lighter fishing vessels can get in and out. So the sandbars provided a unique sort of protection, while lighter merchant vessels could get in and out and therefore use the river to reach Rome and connect Rome through its merchants to the outside world. Being in the middle of the Italian peninsula is a good thing for Rome. By being in the middle, uh, she has equal access in terms of communication in either direction, which means when ultimately Rome conquers and attempts to rule over Italy, uh, she'll be in a better position to control uh, all of those lands. So all of these things are good for Rome uh, in terms of geography. Italy, with its resources, its plains, its fertility, and I might add uh, one of the reasons why there is a lot of fertile soil, especially in what we call Etruria, which is where the Etruscans will be found, and in Latium, which is where the Romans are found, especially uh, in basically these regions, is because there are volcanoes in that region. What do volcanoes give you? Well, okay, the occasional headache, but good soil, volcanic soil, uh, which means uh, that the farmers will benefit from all of that. So Italy, unlike Greece, can support a larger population, a denser population, by ancient standards. Now, eventually, Italy will probably, by the time of Julius Caesar, have 10 or 11 million inhabitants. That doesn't sound like a lot today, but it's an enormous amount of people to be located in that much territory by ancient standards. Um, there will be 10 or 11 million Greeks. Let's go to a map to illustrate that. But this map shows you where they all live. They don't live so much in Greece. Actually, only a minority of the Greeks lived in the region of the Aegean. They had gone into many other places, as we're going to see. And, of course, the Greeks are not united under any particular government, except some of them briefly under Alexander the Great. Uh, but nonetheless, because Italy can support such a large population, and because Rome will eventually control all of Italy, that means that Rome will have the largest potential manpower reserve of all of the civilizations of the Mediterranean world. More soldiers with which to conquer her empire. No other country will have that many people, therefore that much manpower. 
The other thing you like to have if eventually you want to run an empire are a lot of minerals, mineral wealth. There were huge quantities of mineral wealth in various parts of Italy, but most especially, again, in what is known as Etruria, which is just north of Rome, where we're going to find our Etruscans. There's an island. Where do we put it? There's an island off the coast of Italy known as Elba, famous later on as the place of exile for Napoleon Bonaparte. Elba was, in ancient times, one of the, uh, the site of one of the largest iron ore deposits in all of the Mediterranean world, conveniently located there uh, for the Romans when eventually they dominate that territory. Of course, when you're in the Bronze Age, which is where we started this, you're not yet uh, working with iron. Uh, you're working with bronze. What goes into the making of bronze? Anybody remember? Copper and tin. And you find large amounts of copper and tin in Etruria, uh, as well as zinc, silver. Everybody loves silver. Uh, Roman coins would be made chiefly from silver. Later on, when they conquer other people's countries, they get their gold. Okay, But silver is something they're, they're quite uh, fond of. So there will be ample mineral resources. And when the Iron Age comes, the Romans will start out with a good supply of of iron ore. The issue of who the Romans are is what we want to, to tackle next. Um, if you took other courses from me, you would learn eventually about what are called the Indo-European peoples, or Indo-Aryan peoples, as they're sometimes also known depending upon the uh, uh, particular anthropologist you would talk to. We think that about, uh, oh, 6,000 years ago, more or less, 4000 BC, in the region of what would now be the southern regions of Russia uh, and the Ukraine, there was a tribal gathering of peoples, a tribal collection speaking a very, very ancient tongue, uh, which we now generally refer to as the Indo-Aryan language or Indo-European language. Somewhere around 4000 BC and until 3000 BC, they started moving in a lot of directions. They were light-skinned Caucasians, light-haired, often light-eyed, uh, uh, light-skinned Caucasians, uh, in that sense uh, related to other Caucasian peoples like the Semites and others. Uh, but they moved as a kind of pastoral people with their cattle. They were a warrior people in a variety of directions. Some went as far as China and settled in the western regions of what are now China. A number of them tried to invade Mesopotamia. That didn't work. So they moved on, and they became ultimately the Persians, and a large number of them took over most of India as well. Hence the Indo part of the name. The rest went to Europe, hence Indo-European. And today, nearly all the languages of Europe descend from what was the original mother tongue of the tribes of Indo-Aryans in what are now the Ukraine and southern Russia. There are only a few languages in all of Europe today that are not Indo-Aryan in their origins. Um, uh, Finnish, which is my father's background. Lapish, who are sort of uh, Finns without automobiles today. Um, Estonians, who speak a kind of tribal Finnish. Hungarians. I, I know some Hungarian words uh, because I speak Finnish, the words for fish and wood and things like that. They like to tell jokes about each other that uh, thousands of years ago when they were a people in Siberia, uh, they were all moving to Europe and they reached a fork in the road. Now, depending on whether you're Hungarian or Finnish, you tell it differently. But the fork in the road, if you're Finnish, said Finland. The ones who could read went to Finland. The ones who couldn't went to Hungary. Okay, the Hungarians tell it the other way around. Okay, uh, there are other non-Indo-European peoples like the Basques, uh, many of whom ended up in Wyoming and raised sheep over in places like Gillette and things of that nature. But at any rate, uh, nearly all the other languages, including the Greek language and ultimately the Latin language and others, are descended from this uh, original Indo-Aryan tongue. Now, we're pretty sure uh, that the Indo-European peoples began to arrive in Italy somewhere between 1300 and 1100 BC or so. 
Okay? And archaeologists spend a lot of time digging these things up and dusting them off and coming to conclusions of one kind or another. And of course, what they're doing is going layer by layer down farther and farther to understand the cultures of the peoples who lived in various areas. In the region where you would find Rome, they have uh, documented a culture that existed there around 1100 BC, which they call the Urnfield culture. And then about a century later, there is another layer on top of it, which is known as the Villanovan culture, there by about the year 1000 BC. Um, what we find there on the site that is now Rome are huts, metal tools of one kind or another. And we're pretty sure, ultimately, not just the Latin-speaking peoples, some of whom become Romans, but others descended from this Villanovan culture as well. Now, you have a map in your possession that looks like this. And I'm hoping you can read it better in front of you uh, than you can here from the board. But this is a map uh, that shows you the different languages spoken by the different peoples in Italy uh, going back uh, to, oh, probably a couple centuries before and a couple centuries after Rome was founded more or less around 750 B.C. Um, there are what are called the Italic languages, the Italic languages, which are basically located in the middle of the Italian peninsula, what are called the Umbro-Sabalians, the Ligurians. There are the Latins. As a matter of fact, the Latins are specifically right here. And also there are the Feliscans. The Italic languages, including Latin, were all somewhat related to each other. Very similar, maybe even to some extent, mutually intelligible to one another. We have languages today that are mutually intelligible. Uh, there are people in the world who claim to speak the languages of Norwegian, Danish, and Swedish. They will tell you they're different languages. They contrive to spell them differently. They go out of their way to spell them differently. Then they all get in the sauna, and they all talk to each other in their languages and understand each other perfectly well. Okay? Other peoples do the same thing. People who are of Slovak, Polish, and Ukrainian background all insist they have different languages, uh, even so far as Ukrainians do to spell it in a different alphabet. Then they all sit, not in a sauna, but usually at a bar. And they all speak to one another with very little difficulty. Have any of you ever met a person from Scotland? They claim to speak English. <laughs> a person from Scotland will sit with a person from Alabama. I think the Alabamian speaks English too, okay? They will manage to understand one another, right? With some difficulty. What if we spelled Alabamian English the way it sounds and spelled Scottish English the way it sounds? Would they look like the same language? Well, they wouldn't look the same if you spelled it phonetically. I don't think we have letters in our alphabet to spell the way the Scots talk, okay? <laughs> I say that because I had to share a, a house with a Scottish person when I was in London back in the 80s, and I just figured out I'm just going to miss every fourth word, okay? <laughs> and just don't be bothered by it, okay? Just go with the flow and it'll work. But anyway, the idea of mutual intelligibility is, is, is important here. Um, the Latin and Feliscan peoples were probably the closest linguistically to one another. Then we have other peoples uh, who start arriving and settling in the area. The Oscans, the Apigians, and the Piceni, whom you can find there on your map, end up also in central Italy. These are people who speak non-Italic languages. And then for us, more importantly, the Etruscans. Well, what I have them here is they arrive. Maybe. We're going to see there's a debate about whether they arrived or not, or maybe they were already there or some mixture of the two. But somewhere around 1000 BC or so, uh, we notice the Etruscans. And on this map here, the Etruscans are folks who inhabited all of these lands here. That part of Italy today is called Tuscany, coming from the word Etruscans. 
Um, and there's a debate about their origins. It's a very mysterious sort of thing. I don't think quite as mysterious as perhaps the really great film that we're going to watch here eventually. I don't know if we'll do it tonight or next week or not, but they are not an Indo-Aryan people. We are certain their language is not Indo-Aryan, utterly unrelated to the languages of even the other non-Indo-Aryan peoples or Indo-European peoples in the area. And then come the Greeks. Okay, occasionally this happens. Well, come on. There we are. We don't know why that happens, it just happens. The Greeks will arrive in southern Italy and eventually also take over the eastern part of Sicily. This map here shows you if you look carefully, that they inhabited the coastal regions while inland there were other non-Greek speaking peoples. Uh, let's go to another map down here that is really much more useful. Here you can see the whole southern portion of Italy is colored in as having been colonized by the Greeks and then a great deal of uh, Sicily here as well. Ultimately, we will know the southern part of Italy, which was colonized and dominated by the Greeks, as Magna Graecia, Magna Graecia, which is Latin for Greater Greece. In other words, Greece outside of Greece, that sort of thing. And of course, the Greeks who settled there beginning around 750 BC, which is more or less when the city of Rome is said to have been established, will have quite an influence uh, upon the Romans, although maybe not directly at first. We're going to see that especially the uh, Etruscans will be sort of the middlemen between the Greeks on the one hand uh, and, the, and the Romans uh, on the other. Recent archaeology. Recent theories developed by historians tend to emphasize that the peoples of Italy are more like each other than unlike each other. Um, the Romans themselves used to like to assert that they were very different from everyone else around them. Okay. Uh, actually, the evidence that we're getting uh, tells us otherwise, that maybe the reason they repeatedly say, well, we're not like any of them, is, is that they knew they were. Uh, and we'll get into some of the details, especially where the Etruscans are concerned, to see why we know they really are very much alike, with one exception. They are really not much like the Greeks just down the road in southern Italy at all. They will adopt and adapt Greek ideas, the Greek alphabet, but they are not like the Greeks in many key ways. With everybody else, the Latin-speaking peoples who eventually become the Romans share cultural values. Oftentimes when I'm talking about Roman attitudes about the state, Roman attitudes about religion, Roman attitudes about the family, you can just about assume that the neighboring peoples have the same attitudes. That's going to be important for us later on because to absorb them will be not just a question of conquering them, if you conquer a people, you don't necessarily absorb them. But if you're already like them and you conquer them, then you, then you tend to then actually absorb them. And that's a very important theme ultimately for us uh, in terms of understanding the rise of Rome. Your textbook authors correctly emphasize a theme throughout the whole period of both the Roman monarchy and the Roman Republic. And that is that the Romans have this tendency to borrow, some would say steal, uh, not just things or people, but their ideas. Uh, they tend to absorb uh, immigrants. They absorb people. They absorb talent. So the idea of what is Roman is really ultimately a huge sort of cultural goulash into which everything has uh, kind of been, been done. I like culinary kinds of, uh, of references here. They work pretty well. The very earliest of what we would call the tribal culture of the Romans seems especially to be a mix, let's use this map here, of two peoples. Two peoples. The Latin-speaking peoples, not all of whom are Roman, just because you're Latin-speaking didn't mean that you uh, were attached to the Romans, and the Sabine peoples in this area. And what we'll establish uh, later on is that the, the Sabines seem to have been an Italic people who lived in the highlands. The Romans seemed to be, or the Latins seemed to be, the people who were down in the valleys. 
ultimately, especially if you have sheep or other kinds of herds, where do you want to take your herd in the summer? Up in the mountains. And where do they want to go in the winter? And you're going to have to work this out, aren't you? And so we'll look at that later on. Uh, some of the myths we are pretty sure are not really true, but they are metaphors for things like that. How did these things eventually get worked out? Um, then later on, of course, what we're going to look at tonight is, is that the blend of Latin and Sabine cultures then in turn comes under the influence of especially the Etruscans to the north, and then probably through the Etruscans to the Greeks in the south. Not directly with the Greeks, but through the Etruscans with the Greeks. All of these peoples, we think even the Etruscans, descended uh, from the Villanovan folks who were already there probably as early as 1000 BC, despite what they might tell us later on. Let's look at the Etruscans for a little bit, then we're going to take a break, because it's getting very hot. You should have this map, although I think mine is prettier than yours. Mine has different cultures. The debate over the origins of the Etruscans is still with us. We detect them as a civilized people by about the year 800 BC, certainly by 600 BC. Now, some of you have had courses with me already. What does the word civilized mean? Does anybody know? You build stuff. You live in cities and towns. Well, in a community. well, but let's say it's a village. What does a village occasionally do? It moves around. Yeah. So you're civilized when you live in a city or town and have a sedentary sort of culture. Now, it doesn't mean everyone lives in the city or town. It means that the leaders, what you call the political leaders, the religious leaders, probably the economic leaders, tend to be in the cities and towns. Um, frankly, uh, civilization usually uh, keeps the not-so-wealthy peasant element outside the towns. And nearly everywhere we see about 90% of the people of any civilization are farmers, uh, and the other 10%, if that much, sometimes less than that, uh, live off the surpluses that the farmers are producing. Uh, that's kind of a rule of, of ancient times. Uh, very few civilizations that get past that uh, but what I have sometimes called agricultural math. And that agricultural math, how many people can you afford not to have farming uh, while you do all your other things, like raise armies and things of that nature, is one of the things even the Romans are going to run into. We don't use the word civilized as a moral judgment in social science classes. Because actually, truthfully, if you look at the history and behavior of civilized peoples, they don't have as good a record as the ones who weren't civilized. Uh, it wouldn't occur to the less technologically advanced peoples of history that they could actually annihilate whole cultures and races of people. It just doesn't occur to them. Uh, it's the more civilized, technologically advanced peoples who do that sort of thing. Um, there was no more civilized and technologically advanced people in all the world than Germany in 20th century Europe. And I don't think I have to, to go into detail about what that was about. Your aboriginal peoples don't think about the idea of killing entire races. Now, the Romans will be really good at that sort of thing, um, uh, e even with the kind of technology that they will have. But then again, they were among the most civilized of all the peoples. Uh, if you came to this course thinking that we were going to worship Roman civilization for 15 weeks, um, that isn't going to happen. Okay, we're going to look at them warts and all. All right? And there's a lot of warts. Uh, they don't show them on their sculptures. Uh, but nonetheless, we're going to find them nonetheless. Now, one of the problems we have about understanding the Etruscans, uh, who start out living in this uh, dark brown area, uh, is that most of what we know about them actually comes from their enemies. That's not a good way to get to know a people, okay? to have their enemies tell you what it is they think about them. Um, one view that I remember hearing quite a bit of when I was taking uh, my Western Civ class back in 1973. Most of you, well, I don't, were any of you born by then? No. Well, anyway, um, we did teach history back in 1973. <laughs> okay. But uh, there we are. There we are. Don't go too far with that. 
Um, but one of the theories that was uh, very uh, prevalent when I was taking Western Civ is that the Etruscan peoples descended from folks who lived in this peninsula called Anatolia, which is the Greek name for that peninsula. The Roman name for that peninsula will be Asia Minor. Anybody know what's there now? Turkey. Turkey. Turks don't arrive there until the 13th century AD. AD. Now, in very ancient times, a portion of Anatolia consisted of a kingdom, right here, known as Lydia. And one of the theories was that the Etruscans could have originated as refugees uh, from the kingdom of Lydia, um, or uh, from at least Anatolia, from that region. Um, there is uh, a Roman myth that tends to sort of support some of that as well, except the Romans will twist it and use it for their own purposes, uh, having to do with Troy uh, and the possibility that folks from Troy founded Rome. Now, the Romans may have gotten that from a myth in their own times among the Etruscans uh, who might have said the same thing. We don't think so, actually. We don't have any evidence, because now we do uh, know a lot about Troy. We have dug it up. Actually, there are eight Troys, and at about level five is where you get the one that might have been the one that Homer might have been alluding to uh, in, in the Iliad. The other view of the Etruscans is probably the more plausible view now based upon real archaeology, and that is that the Etruscans were always there, and that they had descended from that uh, Neolithic uh, uh, Villanovan culture that had been there as early as 1100 to 1000 BC. Now there's a third view that I'm, I think is kind of charming. If they were already there and always had been there, and if they descended from the Villanovan culture and so did the Latin peoples, then how did they end up with language so differently from each other? The answer may be is, is that maybe the folks who were already there were conquered by folks who came from somewhere else and who brought with them the Etruscan language, which they then imposed upon the folks that they had conquered, which would explain the similarities in terms of architecture, but a minority of perhaps aristocratic warriors taking control, imposing their languages, would have come from a culture very different. Oddly, uh, that seems to be uh, similar to what actually did happen uh, in Anatolia, uh, the Turks, as you know, live there now. Uh, they were no more than a minority when they arrived. Uh, what passes for a Turk today is actually about 90% Greek in their ancient heritage um, and now speaking Turkish, which is why the Greeks and the Turks still don't like each other uh, to this day. So those are the alternatives, so to speak, in terms of the origins of these peoples. The Etruscans became a very sophisticated people very advanced and sophisticated civilization. And a lot of that has to do with trade. They apparently conducted a great deal of trade with more advanced peoples, especially in the 8th century BC. Now this is a map here that will help us with that. Um, the Etruscans, of course, would have been located in the middle region of Italy. The two most advanced peoples with which they would have had contact would have been the Greeks, who originated in the Aegean, but who as early as 750 B.C. were spreading out, as this map shows you, establishing colonies in the Black Sea, along the African coast, in southern Italy, and even the coastlines of what are now France and Spain. They conducted a great deal of trade with all of the peoples of the region, including the Etruscans. The other significant sort of colonizing people were the Phoenicians, who lived in a string of cities along the eastern coastline of the Mediterranean, and they established colonies, especially in northern Africa and in southern Spain. Their greatest colony will be the city of Carthage, which we'll spend some time with as probably the greatest enemy Rome will ever have in all of her history. Uh, the Punic Wars are literally, uh, by ancient standards, the world wars 
with more or less the same devastating consequences as you would uh, see in the world wars of, of modern times. The Etruscans traded with both the Greeks and the Phoenicians. Um, both the Greeks and the Phoenicians would have been interested in the stuff that the Etruscans controlled, especially the minerals. The Greeks were always looking for tin and copper. The Greeks were always looking for iron, because Greece had none. Okay? The Phoenicians were always looking for it because they knew everybody else was looking for it, and they were the middlemen of the Mediterranean. They would buy it from you, and if they could, they'd sell it to the Greeks at a much higher price than the Greeks could get it if they could find it on their own. And so just trade alone brought them together. We notice something that happens in the 8th century B.C. Just as trade seems to get underway with the movement of Greeks and the Phoenicians around the Mediterranean, the Etruscans go through a sudden period of development, a spurt of sudden growth. Their cities grow. Their technologies grow. It is likely because they learned from the Greeks and the Phoenicians how to make the weapons, how to make the tools, perhaps even learned how to build the kinds of structures uh, that uh, uh, were common to both the, the Phoenician and Greek peoples. The Etruscans began to expand their influence after this spurt of growth, and that's what this map here actually endeavors to show you. In several directions, began to push toward the Po River to the north, and they began to push through Latium and what is called the Campania to the south. And of course, Latium includes also what would have by then been the very small town of Rome, kind of the size of Ralston, okay? So don't give up on Ralston. Maybe there's still hope. <laughs> Not as big, probably, as Powell uh, at that time. So at this point, Rome was not much, uh, not much to look at. Um, when we do look at the film, uh, what we're going to see is, is that the Etruscans uh, apparently learned to be good city planners. Building a city is one thing. Planning your city out well is another matter. We know that the Phoenicians were excellent city planners. We can see that in all the colonies uh, that they established. The Greeks are not as good at that. The Greeks just kind of throw things together, okay? And then they think about it later on. Uh, the Phoenicians, and especially the Carthaginians, really plan their cities out. That's a Phoenician trait. And they developed a very, very sophisticated metals industry of their own, which always gives you an advantage uh, as a civilized people. Now, what I want you to understand, though, as you look again at this map, uh, this map could mislead you. There is no such thing as the Etruscan kingdom. There is no Etruscan empire. What you have is within the territories dominated by the Etruscans, leagues of cities, loose confederations of cities. Uh, each confederation, more or less 12 cities. They don't even always get along with each other within their own confederations at all. Each city within any league had its own king. That tells you something right there. A Etruscan king is known as the Lucuman. Now, the thing that is fascinating here is something that will be similar in the Roman monarchy when we look at it, another piece of evidence of the connection. An Etruscan king is not hereditary. An Etruscan king does not have his job on a hereditary basis. Nor does an Etruscan king have absolute power. As a matter of fact, just as we will see in the Roman monarchy, you only have your job because you share it, because you have a partnership with what we call aristocrats, with councils of aristocrats. And when you look at those councils, what you find is that all the aristocrats on them are what we call land-owning nobles, families who own large quantities of land, large estates, and who are also, by definition, the warriors of society. So you only keep your job because the folks with most of the land and who are also the warriors like you. Okay? That doesn't sound like a real powerful king, does it, at all? You find in the Etruscan cities a middle class. 
maybe 5% of the population, which is kind of standard for the ancient world. More or less in most ancient civilizations, 5 or 6% of people would be these kinds of folks. And in the Etruscan cities, they would be shopkeepers, merchants, and what we call craftsmen. That's what the middle class would be, shopkeepers, merchants, and craftsmen. And then there's the lower class, small farmers, for the most part among the Etruscans. But also among the lower classes would what we would call foreign immigrants, people who came for work but who were not landowners, who were kept low in the social structure. And of course, at the very bottom would be slaves. The issue of slavery is something we're going to deal with quite a bit uh, in, this, in this course. By the time we get to the 6th centuries and 5th centuries BC, which would be into the 400s BC, the kings of the cities within these leagues in the Etruscan lands had lost power substantially. In fact, their power was so low that we really can't speak of these cities being monarchies. The best description with these very weak kings dominated by these aristocratic councils is that each and every one of them was, even if it was in a confederation, an aristocratic republic. An aristocratic republic. Which is oddly going to be close to an accurate definition of the Roman Empire, or excuse me, the Roman Republic at one point. Now, does some of you have had courses with me and could answer this question? Is a republic automatically democratic? No. no. The word republic doesn't mean that you have a democracy. That's a kind of recent thing, okay? Uh, a republic is simply a form of government where you choose your leader by some method other than hereditary factors. And we already established that these kings were not hereditary, okay? Later on, we're going to look at the Roman Republic, and there are a lot of people walking around who think, well, the Roman Republic was a democracy. No. No. There's a lot of voting going on, okay? It doesn't make you a democracy either. Um, I lived in the Soviet Union, uh, and uh, there was a lot of voting going on. In fact, they were so enthusiastic, according to Pravda, that 110% of the people would vote every time. Okay? Um, that didn't make them a democracy, all right? And the People's Republic votes all the time, okay? But there's only one name on the ballot. That doesn't make you a democracy, okay? So being an aristocratic republic, uh, whether you're looking at the Etruscan system or the Roman system, is going to be one of the things we're going to focus on as a commonality between them. And we need a break. Ten minutes, okay?